Hello, Isaac here. Welcome to my YouTube channel. So, this is part five of a series going through Josephus' book against Apian. If you've been following this series, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. And please do like and subscribe so you can keep track of future videos. So, in the last video, we saw Josephus turn to Apian, providing a response to his account of the Judean migration from Egypt as well as his arguments against the Alexandrian Jews, and Apian's chief claim that the Jews have no right to be called Alexandrian citizens. Next, he will address Apian's charges concerning rituals practiced in Jerusalem Temple and the Jewish law. This will include the famous story that there is a statue of a donkey or the golden head of a donkey in the Holy of Holies of the Jerusalem Temple as well as a general mockery of the Judean God and laws, including the Jewish culture rules that prohibited pork and the practice of circumcision. So, let's begin. Therefore, Apian slandered the temple in Jerusalem, stating that in its shrine, the Holy of Holies, they had set up a head of a donkey and worshipped that animal. In fact, this tradition of associating the Judeans with the worship of a donkey is quite widespread and found in seven different ancient sources, such as Messias, Diodorus, Apian, Plutarch, Tacitus, and Democritus. Apian claims that this statue was revealed when Antiochus IV Epiphanes plundered the Jewish temple in 167 BC and discovered this statue of a donkey. Now, for some context, the Greek Empire was divided up among the generals of Alexander the Great after his death, and three main dynasties appeared, with Judea being ruled by the Seleucids. Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who ruled the Seleucid Empire from 175 BC, had a strong Hellenizing policy, which sought to strengthen his kingdom through founding and fostering Greek cities. But this also included suppression of non-Greek beliefs and practices in Judea. The Seleucid version of history praised Antiochus for seeking to civilize this misanthropic and superstitious nation, as Tacitus would write. The Jews were regarded as the meanest of their subjects, but after the Macedonians gained supremacy, King Antiochus endeavoured to abolish Jewish superstition and to introduce Greek civilization. The war with the Parthians, however, prevented his improving of this basest of peoples. This suppression of Judea began, according to the Book of 1 Maccabees, after his victory over Ptolemaic Egypt in 169 BC. For he entered the city of Jerusalem with his army and plundered the temple and entered the sanctuary. 2 Maccabees tells us that they had polluted the temple in Jerusalem and called it the temple of the Olympian Zeus. Josephus tells that they had built an altar upon God's altar and that they had slew swine upon it. Nonetheless, Apian states that when Antiochus IV Epiphanes plundered the Jewish temple, he found in its shrine the Holy of Holies, the statue of a donkey. In response, Josephus first comments that even if it were true that there was a statue of a donkey in the temple, which he isn't, it shouldn't be an issue for Apian since he is an Egyptian and worships all kinds of animals as gods. But Josephus is clear that it isn't true, for although various misfortunes had befallen Jerusalem, from Antiochus Epiphanes to Pompey the Great, Crassus, or more recently for him, Titus Caesar, on all these occasions, when the temple was occupied, Josephus argues that nothing of that sort was ever claimed to have been found in the temple or communicated to have been found at the time. Next, Josephus shifts his focus to the unjust nature of Antiochus's plundering of the temple, which he claims happened because of his shortage of funds, as attested by many other historians. 
Josephus urges Apian to seek out the true facts regarding the events surrounding Antiochus's plundering of the temple. But the problem is, and this is where Josephus gets personal, Apian has the mind of an ass and the imprudence of a dog. For Josephus makes it clear that for the Judean people, no honor or authority is accorded to donkeys or any other animal as the Egyptians. Instead, as he writes, asses are used to carry the goods loaded onto them. If they wander into threshing floors and start eating, or do not go the distance required, they get a very good beating, as serving the labor and necessary tasks of agriculture. Now, besides this story, Apian also included Menelaus's story of a golden ass head from the second century BC. The story goes that during a war between the Jews and the Idumeans, inhabitant of an Idumean city called Dorai, who worshipped Apollo and was called Zabidus, came to the Jews and promised to deliver into their hands the god Apollo. Zabidus arrayed himself an outfit which made him look like stars traveling upon the earth. And the Judean people believed it was Apollo and remained at a distance, stunned as he simply walked into the sanctuary and snatched away the golden head of the ass. The point of the story is not so much the donkey worship of the Jews, but the gullibility of the Jews and the theft of this idol in the temple, which provided the final victory of the Idumeans. But one response from Josephus is the sheer impossibility of someone even entering the sanctuary in the temple. As he writes, the doors of the sanctuary were 60 cubits high and 20 cubits wide, all overlaid with gold and practically solid metal. They were shut each day by no fewer than 200 men, and it was forbidden to leave them open. So it was easy, I suppose, for that lamp bearer to open these gates by himself and to go off with the pack ass's head. So this ends Josephus' response to the claim that Judeans worship an ass or the golden head of an ass in the Jerusalem temple. The question is, however, is where exactly does this claim of a statue of a donkey in the Jerusalem temple originate? Well, one interesting theory put forward by Bar, Kokhva and others is that its roots lie in the Egyptian association of the ass with the god Seth, named Typhon by the Greeks. This god was associated by the Egyptians with their enemies and invaders. As Barkotfa writes, the old Egyptian deity Seth gradually acquired the character of the devil, the bad deity, the source of all evils and misfortunes besetting the Egyptians and their gods. The lists of the disasters brought about by Seth include darkness, mass deaths, diseases and storms. He was also regarded as the god of the wilderness and nomads of foreign countries and of alien residents in Egypt, especially Semites, I was explicitly identified with Baal and other foreign deities. It was therefore only natural for the Egyptians, who were at least annually reminded by their Jewish neighbors about the stories of the Exodus, to identify the Jews' God or Moses with Seth. These associations with Seth were reinforced by Manetho, who described the city of Avaris, the former capital of the Hyksos, as from earliest times Typhonian and the archaeology at the Varis has confirmed that the main temple and deity was Seth and that he was also identified by the Semitic people with the Canaanite storm god Baal. Moreover, even after the expulsion of the Hyksos, the temple of Seth remained in continuous use, as James Hoffmeyer writes. The excavations at Tel El Dabar in recent years show that the so-called expulsion of the Hyksos by King Atmos at the outset of the 18th dynasty did not result in the obliteration of the city, although tombs were plundered. While the site for the most part seems to have been abandoned, the Seth temple continued to be in use throughout the 18th dynasty until major renovations were initiated under Hornheb. 
Since the Ceph temple was permitted to function on some basis, it appears that there must have been a sufficient number of possibly Asiatic devotees. Therefore, given the Egyptian association between the Jews, the Hyksos and the city of Avaris, as well as the mystery surrounding the contents of the Holy of Holies in the Jerusalem temple, since the Gentiles were not permitted to enter the shrine and only the high priest was allowed access once a year, it was natural for them to spread a rumour that these alleged Seth worshippers had a statue of an ass inside, the form often associated with that deity. Now, for the Egyptians, there was nothing necessarily negative about this association, but the continuation of the idea especially by Greco-Roman authors, is not so much because of the connection to the Egyptian god Seth, but due to the general contempt afforded to donkeys. Which is why it was well suited to Apian's purpose of ridiculing the Jewish faith. For the donkey as a beast of burden is symbolically associated with submissiveness, low status and poverty. Interestingly, this carried over into Christianity as there has been found a piece of Roman graffiti from around 200 AD scratched on the wall of a room near the Palatine Hill in Rome, which depicts a young man worshipping a crucified donkey-headed figure with a Greek inscription which states Alexmos worships his god, indicating that it was apparently meant to mock a Christian named Alexmos. This graffiti would point to the foolishness of someone that would both worship the Jewish donkey-headed god that is then, even worse, embodied in the utterly shameful, crucified person of Jesus. Next, Josephus responds to another story from Apian regarding the Jerusalem temple, which is that they annually murder or sacrifice a foreigner kept hostage there. Again, Apian says that Antiochus found a man in the temple when he plundered it, and that this man, who was a Greek, had been kidnapped, taken to the Kemp temple, and shut in there. As Josephus writes, summarizing Apian, they would capture a Greek foreigner fatten him up over a year, then take him out to a certain wood and kill the man and sacrifice his body in accordance with their rites and eat from his innards. And while sacrificing this Greek would swear that they would nurture hostility towards Greeks. Josephus, after asking some searching questions to poke holes at this story, details the design of the temple and the system of courts which regulated access to attain its strict sanctity to show that no personnel could come and go as any part of the temple complex where the Greek might have been secluded, as he writes. For it has four surrounding courts, and each of these had its own protection in accordance with the law. Thus, anyone was allowed to enter the outer court, even foreigners. Only menstruating women were prohibited entry. To the second court, all Judeans were admitted, together with their wives, if they were free of all impurity to the third, male Judeans if they were clean and purified, to the fourth, priests wearing priestly vestments, but to the inner sanctuary only the high priests dressed in vestments special to themselves. But in any case, Josephus concludes that this story is simply the grossest impiety and a deliberate lie intended to mislead those who are unwilling to investigate the truth. This story relates to another of Apian, which is that the Judean people swear by the God who made heaven and earth and sea to show good will to no foreigner, especially not to Greeks. The response from Josephus is that this is not only false, but absurd, as the Greeks are separated more by geography than by customs, so we feel towards them neither hatred nor envy. Moreover, he points to the fact that many Greeks have in fact become proselytes and have embraced the Jewish laws. There is also from Apian a denigration of Judean history. Evidence of the fact that the Judeans do not follow just laws or worship God is proven by the fact that they have had many misfortunes affecting the city. 
coming from the likes of the Persians, Ptolemies, Seleucids and Romans. The problem with this argument for Josephus is that it turns equally against Apian, for the Egyptians themselves were subservient to the Persians and to the Greeks with a status no different from slaves as Josephus writes. On the other hand, the Judean people were entirely free and independent from 167 BC after the successful Maccabean revolt against the Seleucids, and they were free up until the time of Pompey the Great in 63 BC. Apian further relates that no remarkable men, inventors or intellectuals have come from Judea, or at least nothing like Socrates, Zeno, Clarethes, or even someone like himself. The point for Apian, and this one through many of his arguments, is that the Judean nation is historically, politically, and culturally insignificant. This may also relate to the citizenship issue in Alexandria, for Apian believed that Judeans were simply not worthy enough to qualify for this honour. The response from Josephus is to point Apian to read their ancient histories. Certainly, in Josephus' previous book, Jewish Antiquities, he makes a point to depict the personalities of Judean history as great inventors and intellectuals. For example, Abraham is credited with transmitting mathematics and astronomy in Egypt, Solomon is the wisest of all men, and some gestures in his work indicated that Moses is the earliest lawgiver and a source of truth for Greek philosophy. Last of all, Apian dies to Jews for sacrificing tame animals, for not eating pork, and for circumcision. Regarding the first, Josephus says that the practice of killing tame animals is something that the Judeans held in common with the rest of humanity, even if the Egyptians do not practice it. The other two, of not eating pork and circumcision, were often used by greco roman authors to mock the Jews. But Josephus tells that the Egyptians shared these practices, especially amongst their priesthood, so it's somewhat hypocritical for Apian to disparage the practice among the Jews, given that Apian is an Egyptian himself. This, however, ends Josephus' section on Apian, and he ends by pointing to the rather ironic death of Apian, for he says that he was circumcised in an emergency because of an ulcer on his genitals, but gangrene set in and he died in extreme agony. Okay, thank you for watching. This is the last video of Josephus' response to Apian, but it's not the end of this series. In the last segment of Book 2, Josephus will return to accusations against Judeans by the critics Apollonius, Amolon, and Lysimachus, but its structure and rhetorical tone will be quite different from the previous section, as he meets these charges indirectly, and he will focus more on providing a positive case for Judaism, the goodness of Moses, the Judean constitution, and the Judean laws. So that is what we have to look forward to in the next video. So I'll see you then. Bye.